I just want to read to you a passage. I'm reading from the Amplified Bible, and so it's not there in, in the same light as your um, King James. But I just want to read it to you from the Amplified Version of the Bible, Hebrews 4, verse 12. It says, For the word of God is living and active and full of power, making it operative, energising and effective. It is sharper than any two-edged sword, penetrating as far as the dividing or the division of the soul and spirit, the completeness of a person, and of both joints and marrow, the deepest parts of our nature, exposing and judging the very thoughts and the intentions of the heart. Quite complex, isn't it? It's quite complex of exactly how far the Word of God can go, which means the Word of God is able to sort out complexities. Is anyone here that would like to stand up and talk about the deepest parts of our nature and fully explain the deepest parts of our nature? No one possibly could. However, the Word of God is able to go down and sort out and divide, clear up, fix up the deepest parts of our nature. There is no part of your nature that's too deep that the Word of God cannot fix. Therefore, there is nothing happening in your life that's outside of the scope of God's Word and its power and its ability to reach you. There's nothing that can be hidden. There's nothing that can't be pierced. It's a sharp two-edged sword. And in my little footnotes here it says, concerning this Greek word, it's used for a knife by a by priest to slit the throat of sacrificial lambs for the knife, scalpel, also used by a surgeon. Soul and spirit here is to emphasise the whole person and not two separate entities in other passages. So here we see that the word of God is a sharp two-edged sword. It cuts going in and it cuts going out. It's effective, it's operative, it's full of power, it's life-giving, it's able to expose and judge the very thoughts and the intents of the heart and no one can really know what your heart or what your heart is capable of doing. No man can know the heart, the Bible says. Who can know the heart, Jeremiah had to say. The Bible says there in Jeremiah that the heart's not such a good thing. It can lead you the wrong way. Out of it proceeds both good and evil. He said, who can know it? So the Bible is given to us as a discerner and a judge and to be a ruler over our heart. Now Colossians 3 verse 15 says, to let the peace of God rule your heart. So there is a ruler and that is the peace of God. The word of God is able to sift and analyse and come right down into the very deepest parts of my nature and expose the things that need to be exposed to bring to light the things that need to be brought to light. Have you ever prayed that prayer, oh God examine me and try the reins of my heart? Psalmist David prayed that. He said, God look at me, try me, prove the reins of my heart if there be anything untowards in me. The Psalmist David also said, he said, Lord keep your servant from presumptuous sins, then shall I be upright and I shall be free from greater transgression. If there's one thing you want to be free from and that's the power of sin. The Bible says, for sin shall not have dominion over you, for you are under grace and not under law. See, so this word is able to come down, it's able to sift and analyse and sort out the very deepest parts of your nature and bring everything to the light that needs to be brought to the light. And we need to have everything brought to the light. I don't want any hidden thing kept right down in me that I've kept from God or I've kept secret from God because whatever I keep secret from God, I keep myself separated from God. If I keep a secret from God, then I keep a part of my heart separated from God. But the Bible says to love God with all of your heart, and therefore you must be transparent with God with all of your heart. Trust in the Lord with all of your heart and lean not to your own understanding. In all of your ways acknowledge him and he will direct your paths. But God, I want you to look in my heart and I want, Lord, that sword of the Spirit to come down, cleave right down deep in my heart. Lord, I want you to sift and analyse the deepest parts of my nature. God, I know that your word is able to sort out every part of my life. May the word of God sort out every part of your life. May God lead you through the scriptures, the pages of your Bible and let them speak into your life. Because when God corrects you, he corrects you in a loving way that actually brings you closer to God. Now we correct our children. We hunt them with a stick. You know, I've been reading in the Bible during the week how the Bible says to hit your kids with a stick. <laughs> Foolishness is bound in the heart of the child and only the rod of correction will drive it far from him. Imagine what the, uh, the liberation people would say about that nowadays. They'd have you in jail, they'd have all sorts of things. You'd be in all sorts of trouble. Uh, but the Bible says, you know, and then the Bible speaks about beating your children. Oh, what do you think about that? Beating your children to bring them into line. Well, well, you can be locked up for that, can't you? The kids can go to the cornflakes packets and call the children helpline and you'll have the police on your doorstep before you know it. We're living in a different world today. But these things still remain pillars of truth. Jesus confirmed many of what the prophets had to say. And when Jesus confirms something, then it's confirmed. And so 
we have this contradiction of what's socially acceptable and what the world expects of us and what the Word of God requires. Um, when we read the Old King James Version of the Bible, if you'd like to turn there with me to the book of Hebrews, chapter 4, verse 12, we read this. For the Word of God is quick, which means it's alive. It's powerful. It's sharper than a two-edged sword, piercing even under the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and of the joints and marrow, that is, the very, even the very central parts of your bone, and is the discerner of the thoughts and the intents of the heart. See, it's a discerner of the thoughts and the intents of the heart. Now, if God's word can be a discerner of the thoughts and the intent, then God, through his word, can arrest me in my intent. If my intent is wrong, then the word of God can arrest me in my intent. Now, it's true to say that you will never, ever do anything in life unless you firstly intend to do it. I mean, we're not just a, a, a piece of... Uh, Flesh wandering around, just bumping in and just doing as it wills. There is a there is a will. There's a soul. There's a mind. There's there's an intellect. There's a personality. There's intention, and uh, and uh, you 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 can't do anything without firstly going in your mind and premeditating and creating some sort of intention. I intend to do something. I do it because of my intention. So the word of God is able to arrest my attention, or the word of God is able to come and bring discernment concerning my intention so I don't make a wrong step according to my intention. There'll be something of the Spirit of God that will alarm my heart in the realm of my intention to divert, to divert me in a right and proper way if I'm about to be diverted in a wrong way. The Word of God is the discerner of the thoughts and the intents of the heart. So God, let's pray right now. Father, I ask you, by the power of the Holy Spirit, to eliminate the word of God in my heart, to govern me in my intent so I don't make a wrong direction, a wrong choice, but you will come in and govern the intent of my heart by the word of God because that word, it's a lamp to my feet. It's my light in Jesus' name. Now in Ephesians 6 verse 17, the Bible says, to take up the sword of the Spirit which is the word of God. So the word of God is your sword. All the armour of God, every part of it is defensive. First of all, uh, the Bible speaks about having your loins good about with truth and having your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace and taking up the breastplate of righteousness the helmet of salvation, and the sword of the Spirit. So all the armour of God is, is for your protection. It's all there for your protection. But there is only one sword, and that's the word of God. So we can't go into battle with just protection alone. We have to have a sword. So we, we overcome evil with a word that's good. God's word is a good word. We overcome evil with good. We overcome Satan, by the blood of the Lamb, by the word of our testimony, and by our unconditional obedience to God. Now, when Jesus was tempted in the wilderness, he only overcame Satan through the word of God. Now, Jesus, with one word, could have destroyed Satan. When the devil came to tempt him, Jesus could have said to the devil, Devil, you get off this planet. And because God, Jesus is God, and God was talking... God could have said to the devil, get off this planet, and the devil had to go. That's all he had to say. But no, Jesus overcame the devil with the word of God to prove to us that we too can overcome the devil by the word of God and use the sword of the Spirit. And if we'll use the sword of the Spirit, then the, then the armour of God will be there to protect us when a blow comes our way. And I'll tell you something, in life you get plenty of blows. But the thing is, what we have to do in battle is not drop our sword. You can't just throw your hands up in the air and say, well, I'm just sick of this, this is all too much of me. I'm going to go back. What have you got to go back to? Oh, well, I'll just turn to the side. Well, there's no exits. There's no off-ramps. This is a forward and upward call. 
I've got to press towards the mark, the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. Looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despised the shame, and is seated at the right hand of God. He got, he got to the cross, he overcame the devil, and he overcame the devil through the word of God. And if he didn't overcome the devil through the word of God, he'd never have been qualified to go upon the cross because he would have come, succumbed to the temptation. He'd never have been qualified as a man then to go to the cross. He had to defeat the devil in the wilderness as a man so he could defeat him spiritually upon the cross and spoil principalities and powers. So the word of God, is, it's, it's the keeping of your soul. The word of God is the keeper of my soul. It's, it's, it's the keeper of my heart. It's the keeper of my mind. Thou shalt keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed upon thee. In Romans 10, the Bible says, The word of God is nigh thee. It's in thy mouth and it's in thy heart. That is the word of faith that we preach. So I, I depend upon the word of God being nigh me, which means it's near me. I don't always find Bible verses coming up through my head all the time, but I, I draw near to God and I remind myself of his word. And when I start to think about the word of God, I find the word of God is near and the scriptures start to open up in my heart again without reading. The word of God is near me. It's in my mouth and in my heart. That is the word of faith that we preach. I'm always confident that the word of God will come to me in a time of need. That's my sword. I must carry that sword and I keep it sharp. I keep it sharp by using the sharpener. So if, is there, a, is there a, a knife here? That's a Stanley knife. I want a kitchen knife. <laughs> right. What's... Make sure he's screened before he comes to the church next time. He, he's, got, he's got all sorts of associates, and I don't know much about him. What's he doing with that in church here? I keep, see, I, I keep the word sharp. I keep my sword sharp by keeping it in the sharpener, in and out of the sharpener. See? That's how I keep the word of God alive and sharpen me, by keeping my sword in the sharpener. I do it at home. Now, Amanda doesn't know this, but I sharpen all the knives at home. I, I put them in the sharp. Oh, that looks sharp, see? And that's what you do. That's what you do with the wood. Oh, it's a terrible example, but not much of an example. But, um, and the blade doesn't go back in as the blade's not a retractable. Um, but if you keep yourself in the wood, you see, you, you, your spirit will stay sharp. And, and it's, it's, it's really simple. If ever there's a spiritual principle, put a, put a practical application. The word is near me. Uh, 1 John 2 verse 20 says, You have an unction and you know all things. Everything that you need to know, God will reveal it to you by his spirit. In 1 John 2 verse 27, the Bible says, The anointing which you have received in you abides in you, and you need not any man teach you. That same anointing teaches you, and even as it teaches you, you shall abide in him. So the anointing of God's spirit, what does the anointing of God's spirit do? The anointing abides within me. Okay, so here it is. The, the anointing abides in me. Now, therefore, when I hear the word of God, it filters through the anointing and comes into my spirit as an anointed word. That's how the anointing works. The, the, the anointing actually teaches me the word of God. So I hear the word of God. It comes in my ears and it filters through the anointing over my spirit and it's the anointing that teaches me the word of God so I have an anointed word in my heart. So the word of God must be anointed. Now, you, you have the sword of the Spirit. It's the operation of the Spirit. It's the operation of the Spirit manifesting his word so the word becomes yours. So what I have is the word of God. When I hear the word of God, I hear it, I listen to it, I believe it, and as Jesus said, let these sayings sink down into your ears so the word of God becomes mine. I've heard the scripture, I've heard it said, it takes time for me to understand I'm leaning towards it. Yeah, yeah, I'm getting it. I'm getting it. I'm getting it. I'm learning to understand. All this, yeah, I got it. It's mine. I've caught it. It's like you've, you've caught the fish. See, Jesus said, follow me and I'll make you fishes of men. Now, it's a different thing to having that fish on the line and getting it up into the boat. Anyone who's fished, and I love fishing, will know that. And, you know, it takes time to fish. And when you fish, sometimes, when I go on deep sea fishing, you know, you've got to let the... You've got to let that fish run with the line. And eventually the fish ties itself out. And you start to reel it in. Pull up, reel in like that. You pull up like that and you drag it in like that. It's like dragging a sea monster. It's one of those big kingfish. And you drag it up. And you know, it's like studying the word of God. You know, it's, there's weariness. It, 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 it's, there's weariness of the flesh in studying the word of God. It's not easy studying the word. It's not easy disciplining your mind to study the word of God. 
but you need to study the Word of God because all of a sudden, bang, it all clicks. It all just sort of comes together. And the thing is, you might have been reading for weeks and weeks and gone over maybe for some years, and all of a sudden, it just rings clear. And that's because the anointing which abides in you has taken those things that you've read and those things you've heard through your ears, and all of a sudden, the Holy Spirit has simplified it and taught into your spirit, and this is the word that becomes the sword of the Spirit. It becomes the sword of your spirit. The word of God is the sword of the Spirit. But it must become your sword, you see? And that's why we have the Holy Spirit to teach us the word of God. So Jesus was made flesh, and he dwelt amongst us. Jesus was made flesh, and he dwelt amongst us. Now, if you have a look with me in, in John chapter 1, verse 14, and if you'll just like to turn back there a few pages with me, We read here in 1 John 1 verse 14, oh, sorry, John 1 verse 14 says, and the word of God was made flesh. Okay, so the word was there, but it was made flesh, and it dwelt amongst us. And we beheld his glory as the glory of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Now remember, the law came by Moses, but grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. See? We see this here, for the law, verse 17, I'm jumping, jumping, jumping ahead here. Verse 17 says, for the law was given by grace, uh, but the law was given by Moses, but grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. No man has seen God at any time, the only begotten Son, which is the bosom of the Father, he hath declared him. And John the Baptist, of course, he had to say, that, and John, the record son, saw the Spirit descending like heaven, from heaven like a dove, and it abode upon him. And I knew him not, but he sent me to baptize with water. The same said unto me, whom you see the Spirit of God descending and remaining upon him, the same as he which baptized with the Holy Ghost. And John said this, that I saw and I bear record that this is the Son of God. So uh, the law came by Moses. And what did the law do? The law created the boundaries of what was right and what was wrong. Okay, because, you know, Moses had to write laws like... Um, uh, Forgive me, please, but he had to write laws like a man will not lie with his mother-in-law. Now, I thought, why, why Moses are you saying things like that? Because human, the human race had fallen so far that God had to bring a man down, to, a man had to raise up a man upon the earth to write down the difference between what was right and what was wrong, and then there are things that I don't really want to say that are also written in there that no one should have to say, but yet Moses had to say it. So, so human, the human race had fallen so far they'd been in, 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 under Egyptian slavery and, and paganism for some 430 years and paganism demoralises human beings. Uh, paganism is the demoralisation of human beings, of humanity. And so God had to try to somehow build humanity again. So the law came through Moses which created the boundaries of right and wrong and certain sacrifices for atonement. And, of course, you read about it in Leviticus, Deuteronomy, and the law of the Old Testament there. But grace and truth came by Jesus Christ that a man might be saved by grace through faith, and that's believing the word of God, and not of works, not of any kind of ceremonial law. Now, we have the law of the Ten Commandments. That's the moral law. But the ceremonial law has been done away with. But we still have the Ten Commandments, which, which are still the moral law. You know, you shall not... Covet your neighbour's goods. You shall not commit adultery. You'll not steal, murder, etc. Those Ten Commandments are given there to create moral boundaries for us today, which again are common to mankind. So we don't slip and fall. They are a guideline once again to that which is right and which is wrong. But they are also filtered into the life of the New Testament for the believer. Now, um, we have, um, we have, when when the Spirit of God descends upon Jesus, we have. We have the Spirit of God coming down and we have God in three places at once. We have a threefold witness. We have the voice coming out of heaven saying, this is, this is my beloved Son in whom I'm well pleased. Hear ye him. We have the Spirit of God descending upon Jesus who is the Son of God, the Lamb of God, and the voice of the Father. So we have this threefold witness the witness of God, 
And then we've had the witness of man from John the Baptist who saw this and beheld it. Now, in 2 Timothy 2 verse 15, we read this. To study to show yourself approved unto God a workman that need not be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. So we need to study to show ourselves approved a workman that need not be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. I believe this. I believe in reading a, a chapter of Proverbs. There's 31 Proverbs. You can read a chapter of Proverbs every day. We have the Old Testament. We have the New Testament. We have things that are valid in the Old Testament for our example today. But we live in the light of the New Testament. But we can take passages from Proverbs. We can take passages from Psalms. We can take passages from Genesis. We can take passages from Revelation. We can take passages from the Gospel. And we can paint a beautiful picture of truth that doesn't confuse or religiously confuse the hearer. And it's all communicated in the light of the gospel, which is appropriate for every New Testament believer because we are a New Testament people. We're not living by law. We're living by the power of God's grace. And we are saved by grace, for by grace you are saved through faith and that not of yourselves, it's a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. So each and every one of us here today, we're saved by this wonderful act of God's grace. He placed his spirit upon us and he drew us to himself through the gospel. Then in Joshua 1 verse 8, God said to Joshua after Moses, he said that this book of the law shall not depart out of your mouth, but you shall do what it says, meditate in it day and night, and then God will make your way prosperous and you'll have good success. I tell you something I've learned over many years. If you'll begin to study the word of God, if you'll start to study particularly what God is showing to you, if you'll start to study the scripture, particularly what God is highlighting to you in the scripture, and if you'll begin to meditate, if you'll begin to learn that passage of scripture off by heart, it will get down into your spirit. It will come through the Holy Spirit that's the guide over my heart. The Holy Spirit will take that scripture that I'm learning, that scripture that I'm putting to memory, that scripture that I'm committing to memory, and the Holy Spirit will teach that scripture that I'm studying and he'll drop it down into my spirit. And then as I draw that word from my spirit, that word then becomes the sword of the spirit. And Jesus said unto you, the words that I speak unto you, they are spirit and they are life. But it's the sword of the Spirit. That's what you're building. The sword of the Spirit. And then you keep your sword sharp by keeping it in the sharpener. Keep yourself in the word of God and you'll keep your sword sharp. So God said that this book of the law, he said this to Joshua. Moses had a great mandate. He was the principal Old Testament prophet. He was the greatest of all the Old Testament prophets. Well, they were all great. But he said, to, he said to Joshua, he said, Joshua... He says, as I was with Moses, I'm going to be with you. He said, I want you, he told him four times to be strong and of good courage and that the word of God wasn't to depart from his mouth, but he was to meditate in a day and night. God would make his way prosperous and he'd have good success. I'll tell you something, in 3 John 2 we read this, Beloved, I wish above all things that thou mayest prosper and be in health even as your soul prospers. And that little word prosper in the Greek is a word called you do, E-U-O-D-O-O, and it means to succeed in business. That's what the word prosper means. It means to succeed in business. You can't spiritualize it if you want to. It means to succeed in business. And to be in health. The word health is a word called hugiano. Hugiano in the Greek. And it means to be in continual health constantly. It means to stay in health. That's God's will. Beloved, I wish above all things that thou mayest prosper and be in health even as your soul prospers. And what prospers your soul? It's the word of God. Now Psalm 19 verse 7 says that the law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul, the testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. So God's word will make us wise. The sword, we've got a sword, you can't see it, but it's sharpened into a sword and it works. And that's where faith, that's why we mix the word of God with faith, because when we mix the word of God with faith, then the word of God will accomplish the thing it's sent to do. Now, if you allow the Holy Spirit to illuminate your study, you yourself will become a burning lamp. Jesus gave this parable to, to, to ten virgins. And if you turn there with me to, to uh, Matthew 25. Uh, let's have a look at Matthew 25. Let's have a look, say, from verse 1. Jesus said this, he said, Then shall the kingdom of heaven be likened unto ten virgins, which took their lamps and went forth to meet the bridegroom. 
and five of them were wise and five were foolish. So these were virgins. They were waiting for the bridegroom. Five were foolish and five were wise. It's a bit hard to understand, isn't it, really? That they, were, they that were foolish took their lamps and took no oil with them. But the wise took oil in their vessels with their lamps. And while the bridegroom tarried, they all slumbered and slept. And at midnight, which is a time when you don't expect anyone to arrive, there was a, a great cry that was made. Behold, the bridegroom comes. Br- br- the bridegroom comes. Go ye out to meet him. And all those virgins arose and trimmed the lamps. And the foolish said unto the wise, Give us your oil, for our lamps are gone out. But the wise answered, saying, Not so, lest there be not enough for us and for you. But go rather to them that sell and buy for yourselves. And while they went, went out to buy, the bridegroom came. And they that were ready went in with him to the marriage, and the door was shut. And afterwards they came also the other virgins, saying, Lord, open unto us. But he said, Verily I say unto you, I know you not. Watch therefore, for you know not the day nor the hour wherein the Son of Man comes. Very sobering. Five wise, five foolish. The only difference is that five of them, which made them foolish, didn't carry oil. Now we know, for example that the scriptures tell us, symbolically, that oil is symbolic of the Holy Spirit. And oil has to be in your lamp. And there's one thing about those lamps is that the the wicks had to be trimmed on the lamp. So we have a lamp and we have oil in the lamp. So the word itself is the lamp. And the oil is the Holy Spirit that is given to illuminate the light or to cause the light to shine. So you can have the wick and you can light the wick, but the wick won't continue to burn without the oil. So you've got to have the oil and the wick and the burning wick so you have a bright light. So the word is likened to a lamp to our feet and to a light to our path. So you see, when there's no word or when the word stops or when you stop continuing in the word, then there's no purpose for the oil to be creating any further ignition or light to light up your path. It's a bit like, it's a bit like this, if I could use this for an example. You know when you start a car, you've got ignition that goes through your system to your high-tension leads and then your spark plugs. And when you wind that motor over, if there's no ignition, you can have all the oil in the tank that you like, but that car's never going to start. You've got to have ignition. You've got to have spark. You've got to have some action happening there in your cylinder. Otherwise, all that fuel and all that petrol is of absolutely no use to you at all. And the same too is you can start a car and you can wind it over and over and there's plenty of spark at the plug, but if there's no petrol in the tank, then the spark's going to do nothing. And so we see here something symbolic in the realm of the fact that these virgins, they must have had spark, they were waiting, but there was no oil in their lamps. And they'd run out of oil and it was too late to get oil once they'd run out because the bridegroom was already on his way. And the Bible says half of them missed out. And the Bible says they were only wise or they were foolish according to the fact that whether they had oil or they had no oil. I tell you something, folks. Keep yourselves in the word of God. Keep yourself in the Holy Ghost. Keep yourself in church because there's a lot of people falling away from the Christian faith today. And the Bible says in the last days, the hearts of many shall wax cold and there'll be a great falling away. Don't be one of the ones that fall away, folks. I'll tell you something. Keep yourself alive in God. Keep yourself alive in the Holy Ghost. Keep yourself alive in the Word of God and keep your sword sharp. Amen? This book of the law shall not depart out of your mouth, but you shall meditate in it day and night to do everything, to observe everything that it says, and God will make your way prosperous and you'll have good success. Folks, start to pray. Start to fast. If God leads you into fasting, start to enter into a fast. Press into God. Press into God until you get a breakthrough. Ask God to lead you into it. Your flesh will resist the study. Your flesh will resist prayer. Your flesh will resist church life. Your flesh will resist fellowship. Your flesh lusts against the spirit and the spirit against the flesh. And these are contrary, the one to the other, so that you cannot do the things that you would. That's what Paul had to say. 
Your flesh will always war against the spirit, the spirit against the flesh. And this is a very sad story. It's a very true story. But these were five virgins. These were five people that kept themselves for God. But they simply, half of them simply ran out of oil. Don't run out of oil. Don't run out of oil. Keep yourself living in the presence and in the power of God. Don't run out of oil. Keep yourself living in the presence and the power of God. Keep yourself in prayer. Don't make your prayer around yourself. Don't make your prayer around me, my four, and no more. Keep your prayer around Jesus. Keep him central to your prayer life. Oh, God, I just come here to worship Jesus. Oh, Lord, I thank you that Jesus is the Alpha and the Omega. He's the, my captain. He's the author and the finisher of my faith. He's my way. He's not just the way, the truth, and the life. But, God, I want to follow the one who is my way, my truth, my life. Lord, help me to follow Jesus. Lord, I can't see too clearly at the moment. God, I ask, Father, there be more oil. Let there be more oil in this vessel. Make the word of God, Father, come alive for me today. Lead me through the passages of your word. Help me to be led by the Spirit of God today. God, let me be filled with the Spirit of God today. Lord, let the works of the flesh be burned up in me. Let my eye be single and my conscience clear that my whole body might be full of light. Fill me with all the fullness of God that I might receive the exceeding great measure of the Holy Spirit himself and dwelling in my innermost being and personality that I might be a man wholly filled and flooded with God himself here today. God, fill me with the Holy Spirit. God, let not my oil run down. Let it not run out. I tell you something, folks. There's one thing about oil. There's always a measuring gauge for the bottle. And with your fuel tank in your car, there's always a gauge to tell you how full or how empty you are. When you jump in your car and you turn your ignition light on and you look at your fuel tank, Think about it and say, God, well, how full is my tank today? Am I empty? Am I full? Am I half empty or am I half full? See, measure yourself. Judge yourself. Look at yourself. Correct yourself. Examine yourself, the Bible says. Because if you'll judge yourself, examine yourself, correct yourself, you won't need to be correct, judged or examined by anyone. You can do a self-examination. And when the Bible says, when you gather around that Lord's table in the morning, let a man so examine himself. It's one place where you to examine yourself, not the fellow sitting next to you. Because the fellow sitting next to you is better than what you are. That's why you examine yourself. Examine Muggins here. Examine he. That's what we examine. We gather around the Lord's table, we examine him. No, no, leave him alone. He's a good guy. Just, we're just looking here. Okay. When you meditate, you ingest the word of God into your spirit. That's what you do. You're taking it from your head and you're ingesting it into your spirit. So the word becomes a sword of the spirit. It becomes effectual. It becomes full of power. And it has a carrying distance. The word then has carrying distance. Now Job 22, 28 says that you shall decree a thing and it shall be established and light shall shine upon your path. The psalmist David framed it like this. He said he sent his word and he healed them and he delivered them of their destruction. In Matthew 8, chapter 5, we read this in the ministry of Jesus. Matthew 8, chapter 5. Just this one verse of scripture here. In verse 7, rather, Jesus said to the centurion, I will come and heal him. And the centurion answered and said, Oh, no, 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 Lord, I'm not worthy that you should come under my roof, but speak the word only and my servant shall be healed. Speak the word only and my servant shall be healed. Why, why did that man trust in the word of Jesus? Because Jesus is the word of God made flesh and whatever Jesus spoke would come to pass. What words are you building into your life? You're building into your life, into your spirit, the word of God, just like Jesus as a young boy built the word of God and, 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 he, and, he, and he built the, 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 the spirit of those words into his spirit. He knew that as a young boy that Isaiah 61 verse 1 belonged to him, whereby the spirit of God would come upon him and anoint him to preach the gospel of the poor, to heal the brokenhearted, to bind up... Uh, the broken hearted to set at liberty them that are bruised to recover the sight of the blind and to proclaim a jubilee, a freedom for the people who believe and put their faith and trust in God. He knew that that belonged to him and then in Luke 4, he fulfilled it and he said, this day the scriptures fulfilled in your ears. See folks, Jesus built his life in the word of God as a young boy. He went to Bible college as a young boy. He turned up places where he shouldn't have been as a young boy but he built the word of God into his life. The word of God was built into the life of Jesus. You must study and build the word of God into your life because it's the sword of the spirit. It's the only formidable a weapon of attack you have to, uh, to overcome your adversaries, sickness, 
torments against your children, torments against yourself, fears, phobias, anxieties, all the things that will creep in around your life. It's the sword of the Spirit. It's the sword of the Lord that is your sword of victory to overcome that which is of the world, that which is of the flesh, and that which is of the devil. And Jesus proved it for us. That's why we build, we build it into our life. The centurion said, speak the word only in John 6 verse 63. Jesus said, the words that I speak unto you, they are spirit and they are life. See, they come from my spirit. I didn't make them up. They, they come from my spirit. They're from the God. They're from my spirit and they are life. They are life-giving forces. In Psalm 104, let's have a look here, Psalm 104. Let's look at a few verses here. From Psalm 104 verse 14. Just a few randoms here. Let's have a look at a few randoms. Psalm 104, verse 114 says, This is David, the Psalms of David. Thou art my hiding place and my shield. I hope in thy word. Depart from me, ye evildoers, for I will keep the commandments of my God. Uphold me according to thy word. See, what will the word of God do in the day of trouble? It will uphold you. And if it upholds me, I will live and not be ashamed. I will have hope. That's what the scripture says right there in verse 116. Psalm 119, verse 140. Didn't I tell you that? Well, you were wrong. Okay, let's read together. Psalm 119, verse 114. Sorry. That's the second time I've apologised in my life. <laughs> Look at this here. Look, let's read it. Thou art my hiding place and my shield. I hope in thy word. Depart from me, ye evildoers, for I will keep the commandments of my God. Uphold me according to thy word that I may live and let me not be ashamed of my hope. Hold thou me up, and I shall be safe. Look at that there. Look at this here. See, all this promises because, because of one who will keep his word. And then in 18, he's talking about his evidence. For thou hast trodden down all them that err from thy statutes, and their deceit in falsehood. Thou puttest away the wicked off the earth like grass. Therefore I love thy testimonies. My flesh trembles in fear of thee. I'm afraid of thy judgment. See, the Bible says to keep your heart in the fear of God. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom and knowledge and discretion and understanding. See, see, David knew this. He said, I, I, I've hidden your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. Then in, in, in Psalm uh, 119 verse um, uh, 100, uh, 130 it says here, look at this here, the entrance of thy words giveth light and gives understanding to the simple. Look at this here. So the entrance of God's word brings light and gives understanding to the simple. So how does, this, how does this word enter? I study it, I study it out, I meditate in it, and then meditating it, I commit it to memory. Then as I commit it to memory, I ingest it into my spirit, in my inner man. When I speak that word out by faith, it comes out as a sword of the spirit, and, it, and the word, according to Isaiah 55, will accomplish that which it's sent to do. It shall not return void to me again. It shall accomplish that which it's sent to do. Now, Psalm 119, verse 140 says, Thy word is very pure, therefore thy servant loveth it. Seek seek for what's pure. If you seek purity, you will become pure. You get what you seek. If you mix with a bad crowd, don't think that your disposition will improve. If you mix with a bad crowd and are comfortable with a bad crowd, you will eventually become like the crowd. If you hang around with gossipers and complainers, always where there's a whispering ear, oh, I'm drawn to that whispering, you eventually, if you lean towards whisperers and gossipers and problematic sort of people, you will eventually become like them. And those who hang around whispering, gossipy sort of 
you always treat them with great caution. If ever I find a, a whisperer, I, I, I exercise caution with a whisperer. People always who know more than what they should about people. You know too much about someone that you don't know about. Where are you getting, oh, I heard this from this person, this person was saying this and this person, and that was on Facebook, and it came through there, and then someone sent me an email from that was on Facebook, and, 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 and oh, they gravitate to it. Oh, and that's their life. Oh, they just know everything about everyone. They know everything about it. Oh, they know everyone. Oh, you know, that, that, that person, that ch- they, they've only been in the church three weeks. Oh, we, well, we know all about that person. Oh, they, they, that church, that church. And the, and the, what, what, why are you going there? You know something? That person's, that's none of your business. Have you ever thought to yourself, it's none of your business? Mind your own business? Put your beak back? Pull your head in? Mind your own business? Stop gossiping? But we don't call it gossip. We call it religious intrigue. (laughs) We know everything about everyone. And it's none of your business. I say, I say, I say this, I say, mind your own business. You know, sometimes I hear hear people saying things, you know, something, I I just got to walk, I don't want to know. You know, if someone's got, I don't, it's none of my business. You know, the only thing, even in this congregation, that is my business concerning anyone in this congregation is when someone from this congregation comes up and sees me personally and says, I would like to talk to you about something, then it's my business. And when someone from the congregation says, oh, you need to talk to someone because something's happening there, you know something, that's none of my business. And you need to do the same too. The Bible says to the pure, all things are pure. You've got to purify your heart and not have an itching ear, listening for information about people and about things that have nothing to do with you. It's none of your business. Just look after your own wife, your own husband, your own perfect children, your own perfect parents, and then when everything is above and beyond perfection, then sort everyone else out. That puts us all in our place, doesn't it? It's none of your business. Remind yourself from time to time when you hear something, or if someone tries to entice you or to draw you into something, oh, come on, oh, did you hear this? I say, sorry, it's, it's, it's none of my business. You know something? You can't keep a clean heart and take in everyone's garbage at the same time. Remember this. My heart, my mind, my soul, my spirit is not a garbage dump. I'm going to think upon things that are true, honest, pure, lovely, just, things that are virtuous, things that are praiseworthy, think of these things, things of a good report, those things which are both heard and seen in me, do, and the God of peace be with you. You've got to set your heart and mind more in this than what's out there. And if you'll concentrate and give yourself to that which is in here, you will be able to change your world out there if you will allow this to change you in here and in here and between there. See? If you allow this to change here, you will change out there. I am not a garbage can. I am not a rubbish dump. I do not have Brisbane City Council stamped across my chest and I do not wear a green cap. Saying... Come by 24 hours a day, walk by, MMS, Facebook, email, phone, drop all your rubbish in here. It's an open flap. I tell you something, folks, if you've found that your life, not even willing, not even meaning has become a, some sort of garbage can, buy yourself a lock and lock the top. And think about when you're going to put the key in and what you're going to allow to come into your head. You get filled with the junk and gossip of people and stuff like that, I tell you something, your heart will grow cold and all you'll be good for is just talk. You become useless for the kingdom. 
unprofitable to God and unprofitable for the work of God. You're not a rubbish dump, you're a chosen vessel. Holy, set apart, a peculiar people, zealous for good works. I say this, keep yourself in the word, keep yourself filled with the Holy Ghost, keep yourself unspotted from the world, John says, and God will keep you from falling. Amen. Amen. God bless you. Wonderful. Great to see you today. Great to have you with us. That's all I have to say.